Okay, so um, just real quick, Aisha is the CEO of Zooks. You may have heard of that very secretive, not no longer secretive, I guess, sort of company, um, and, and is formerly with Intel, spent a long time at Intel. Um, David Richter is the chief business officer at Lime, formerly with Uber, and then had a little like inter, a little, a little intermission of four months on the beach between jobs, right? I feel I earned it. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and last but not least, Ken is the CTO of Ford Motor Company. And Ken, you were with Lockheed Martin before, but have been with Ford for a while. Yep. So just to give a little context. Um, and by the way, David's wife was on stage earlier, Jana, and she rocked it, so no pressure. She sets but, the bar high. Yes, That's she really consistent. does. Um, OK, so let's start out. You know, we, we, we like to talk about inflection points in the tech industry, and we've been talking about uh, transportation for a while and the many different ways that it is being disrupted. What and when is the inflection point in transportation from your points of view? Uh, well, it depends on what you mean by what and when. Uh, in terms, of, I think everybody agrees that with autonomy and uh, robotics, it started. Mm -hmm. In terms of uh, being commercial and readily available, it's going to take a long time. It depends. I think robo taxis, for example, may come first. Mm -hmm. uh, passenger cars will get better and better at it, but it'll take a few years before you can just buy them anytime. And then uh, just being safer, being able to drive safety in all types of environments. It turns out human beings are underrated. Mm -hmm. Driving is not just about following rules. There are millions of decisions that we make on a continuous basis. I thought you were going to say that we're overrated because we're such bad drivers. Well, there's that too, <laughs> uh, especially when we're texting and doing things yes. we're not supposed to be doing. We do cause a lot of accidents when we're, we're misbehaving. But basically, the journey has started, and this is going to be one of those super long journeys before it's like readily available for everybody. OK. David, your opinion? So I might offer three different answers. The first is my father, who managed to hit 80 years old and still had a flip phone. This was despite Jana being at Twitter and offering to show him how great it would be to get his news on a smartphone. This was despite me being at a video focused company. It'd be great to get your video on a smartphone. What got him to a smartphone was plain and simple, Uber. Mm -hmm. This allowed someone later in life to have continued mobility and frankly, have a better way of getting around his town. He gave up as a person based in Brooklyn, getting to and from New York City, i.e. Manhattan, by cab because they simply were not available. I like the fact that he and my mom were traveling by Uber. It was simply a safe, reliable, and cost-effective means of getting around. Uh, the second example I might offer would be having the reaction that Uber and now others have had with certain auto manufacturers. I was fortunate to meet Ken back in 2015 when we had discussions with Ford. One of the others that we met with was Volvo. Volvo stands for safety, so it's a very strong indicator that despite its then reputation, Uber was becoming more and more not simply a better means than a cab to get around, but something that would be innovating in terms of AV. Uh, finally, not least significantly, one of the last deals I did while at Uber, my team did rather, was the jump deal, which was electric bikes. And when I left Uber, I frankly had the time and the energy to play with all these different micro-mobility devices and I was blown away by its adoption rate. And that was the thing that led me to Lime, which is that next stage at this moment. Is, is, by the way, is your opinion then that we've already hit that inflection point? Well, I think it varies. In terms uh -huh. of autonomous vehicles, I don't think we're there yet. For micromobility, I believe we are there. So if you travel outside the United States, specifically in Europe, it's a very different ballgame. So, Europeans are more open to non-car means of getting around. They ride bikes in a way that we don't. They also have infrastructure that we lack in the United States. Uh, not least significantly, uh, they're also doing travel that's shorter distance. So two to three kilometers will get you to a very different neighborhood in Berlin or Copenhagen than it would in the United States where we actually have much greater distances to travel. So if you look to Europe, Micromobility is already a very real thing. If you go to Paris with our fleet as well as others, you're looking at well over 20,000 scooters. Germany has now passed federal legislation that legitimizes the use of scooters and being done at a federal level with the great degree of rigor that the, frankly, German legislators applied, it will be more robust than anything we've seen to date. Okay, Ken? Well, I think it's a great question because we all kind of feel it. 
And uh, so, I, you know, my view is we've hit the inflection already. Now we're riding the next S curve. Mm -hmm. It's just mm -hmm. a question of how long will that S curve yeah. um, evolve until it plateaus and we're ready for the next one. Mm -hmm. But we are clearly on the next automotive S curve. You know, that Ford is a 116 year old company. And I would say for the first, you know, 110 of those 116 years, you know, not a lot changed. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a, a sophisticated, complex uh, machine that required a lot of complex manufacturing and design and care and, and testing and validation. Um, but over the last six years, three things have really happened that have put us on this new S-curve of innovation. The first is, is connectivity. Everything changes when you connect devices to the internet, to David's point. And cars are no different. So when you connect cars to the internet, the experience changes, you can update them over the air, you can pipe new entertainment to the vehicle, you can do diagnostics and prognostics on, a, on the uh, equipment to change the, mm -hmm. change the experience of how you actually maintain the vehicle, how you sell the vehicle can change. So connectivity change, changed everything and it's gonna to continue to change everything in automotive. The second big thing that happened is automation. So autonomy, and I say automation because I, I don't want to, to leave the audience with the impression that this is only about level four autonomous vehicles, although that's a huge part of our strategy as well as it is you know, other companies. But automation in, in the automotive industry is happening in lots of places, mm -hmm. including consumer vehicles that we sell that have automation to help you drive and, and help keep you safe, automatic braking, lane centering, highway assist, blind spot monitoring, that's only gonna get better um, with uh, advanced sensing and advanced compute. And then the third thing that's happened that's revolutionized to put automotive industry that's put us on this new S-curve is electrification. Mm -hmm. So the fact that batteries have come down in price, um, there's a worldwide now, you know, with a few unfortunate exceptions, acceptance of the fact that we have to address climate change mm -hmm. and um, we have to unlock the mystery of how to build and design and sell better electric vehicles that are profitable. That last bit of, of um, mystery is gonna really rocket ship us into this next S curve. So I, I think we're already on it. And you mentioned, I mean, these three innovations. Um, you, you all have very, you're from very different companies, different approaches to some of these disruptions that are taking place. So with Zooks, I mean, you guys have taken the approach of building everything from the ground up, uh, you know, building the, the best autonomous vehicle, uh, the, the batteries, the, all of it, right? Even ride hailing service, so why? So, um, What's wrong with existing cars? <laughs> nothing's wrong with them. <laughs> I, I own quite a few of them, and I like cars. Um, the, first, you have to, to think about what happened at inception. Mm -hmm. At inception, Zooks is five years old, so or will be in a, in a couple of weeks, and uh, there was an insight. And the insight is that uh, unless you uh, solve the general AI problem, mm -hmm. um, getting a fully autonomous level five vehicle that drives itself in dense urban environment and having something where the compute and sensor architecture help the vehicle drive mm -hmm. and then do it in such a way that the business model works in dense urban environment, we basically came to the conclusion that we needed to build the vehicle. And we go back to horse and carriage because we tend to forget that they, are, they, are, they did exist at some point. And what happened then is that when we went from horse and carriage to the passenger automobile of today, we re-architected the vehicle to help the human driver. We put a windshield, we put mirrors, we put a steering wheel, we put pedals. Mm -hmm. We did a bunch of things to re-architect the vehicle. So for us, our level five vehicle, which is built and driving around on private roads already, its architecture, how it's designed, is really thinking about how to achieve autonomy and also how to move people from driving, mm -hmm. especially in dense urban environment, to just being transported. So the experience, the safety, the autonomy stack, all of those are integrated. So there's this mis misconception that we're doing all of, we're not doing them separately, uh -huh. we're doing them in an integrated manner to serve the robo-taxi market in dense urban environments. Our vehicle doesn't do anything else, but. Yeah. Is it, Ken, is it fair to say that you have a more iterative approach? You're not jumping to level five? 
So I, I don't know if I would characterize it uh -huh. that way. I, I think what, um, what Zooks is doing is um, not very different than what Ford is doing. Um, we recognize that a level four fully autonomous vehicle that is designed to deploy into a ur dense urban environment to move people and or packages um, has to be designed for that purpose. And the self-driving system, the software system, and the sensor system, and the compute stack all have to be together. together. Yep. And, and the secret sauce, the key, is that the vehicle part also has to be done together mm -hmm. with that. So this is why it was so important when we made the investment in Argo that we kept them close. Uh, so we kind of had the best of both worlds. We had a startup. Mm -hmm. that could act like a startup, hire like a startup, and um, move at the speed of a startup and do what roboticists and AI experts do best. But at the same time, they sat closely with us mm -hmm. and, and worked shoulder to shoulder with the vehicle engineers to integrate that design in with the actual vehicle platform so that when we go to market in the, market, in the environments that we have selected, uh, the vehicle will be in that market in a way that is designed to operate safely, give you a great experience. Oh, and I should say, by the way, it's also very important that, that you identify where you're gonna go to market. Mm -hmm. So you yeah, have to exactly. pick where you go because you have to know the environment, you have to understand what the rules are in that location, you have to work with the city officials, you can't just show up. Um, and so, David, would you like to address? No. So I that's really important. important. I saw you in Paris last week. So. You just showed up. There are a lot of scooters. Well, that, that, that's a fair point. So I, I think it's worth noting a few things. The first is sorry. No, okay. <laughs> People like uh, stress on a panel, but to uh, be the foil. Uh, so first of all, I agree with something I think Ken said earlier, which is the latest trend is. AV plus EV plus ride sharing. Mm -hmm. That's really the next that's wave, good. and that's where we'll reach great fruition. Um, my smaller point of disagreement, perhaps, is that I don't think cars are a great thing in all situations, particularly with the trend toward greater and greater urbanization. We are making a mistake if we continue to follow our past practices. So in contrast, perhaps, to what occurred at a prior company that I was affiliated with, and maybe even at Lime before my time, um, we are working very much with government officials. So we just appointed David Sewell Fogel as our first chief policy officer. This is a former Obama policymaker, as well as for Rahm Emanuel, a long history of working on transportation issues. And in fact, in Germany, we work very much with the legislators to make it happen. So whether that occurred in the past, I can say, I can say that going forward, that is the only way we'll be doing business. In addition, I think if any of us thought about the cities in which we live, we are beholden to our past ways of looking at it. There is no way we would have urban cores with two rows of vehicles simply sitting there not being used 96% of the time. Yep. And that is what parking is. Yep. We should not have that kind of infrastructure. Instead, we should have lanes that allow for all sorts of micromobility as a better, more efficient, and frankly, more fun to, way to get around. As a quick plug for my company, how many people actually have used a scooter, whether Lime or otherwise, by a show of hands? Well, I'm very happy to see that. For those of you who have Your not raised, raised her hand, she better have, <laughs> um, despite investing in one of our competitors before I went to line. <laughs> uh, for those of you who haven't yet, I strongly encourage you to try the limes that are outside. They are our newest generation of scooter. And perhaps to your original question, the reason why we have 75 of our employees based in Shenzhen and the surrounding area is we do the design ourselves. We work with the suppliers directly. One of our three founders is based in Shenzhen because it does matter to get more and more rigorous as to the hardware. This is true in terms of product differentiation, more and more features that matter to folks. Even more important, safety. You will experience the difference in the Gen 3 scooters that are outside if you have used our prior scooters. And for those of you who are nervous about using a scooter, you could be a little nervous at first. Give yourself a chance to experience it the first time, then the second time. You don't have to go all out the first time. You didn't get in a car and nail You're like a scooter coach. I know. <laughs> but I actually wear think your there's helmet. some truth. Wear your yeah, helmet. <laughs> Look for better infrastructure, but then do what you would do with anything that's new. Take it slow at first, and then you'll get more and more comfortable. I promise you, it's not all that hard. And getting 
to used to wearing a helmet, it's not that bad either. We have giveaway helmets. Um, so can I build on something? Yeah, yeah. So, 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 I, I wanted so, to too. So I, I have to build on you this. You went because, like full I'm dad like, on <laughs> Really? So, <laughs> I have to build on this because I, I, you said something extremely uh, powerful and important, and that is that cars aren't the only mode of mobility mm -hmm. that is the solution in, in cities. And you know, we definitely believe that, and I, I am a, you know, we as a company are a strong believer that, that the solution in cities has to involve a new design. Mm -hmm. Has to involve a new design using multiple modes of mobility. And cities, you know, why should, why should the experience of being mobile and getting around in an urban environment uh, be any different than the revolution that's happened in other parts of our lives. You know, mm -hmm. digital has come into our homes, sure they're smart, just... and so cities should be the same way. And you're starting to see a lot of energy and a lot of effort to, to invest in redesigning uh, city streets, putting intelligent um, street lights in place, making parking garages smart, um, enabling uh, the parking lanes to be um, used for multiple purposes. And if we think about the design of those future environments, we should be designing our vehicles, our cars, our scooters, mm -hmm. our public transportation systems to all interoperate in a smart and where, intelligent way. Where are you seeing these changes? Because at least in the US, I haven't been to many cities that look very different from the way they looked 10 years ago. Well, I think we're going to have to earn it. Uh -huh. I mean, uh, all of a, a lot of us are citizens, and we know that uh, there's not some big pool of money that's going to come in and change these cities to whatever it is, and then we uh, provide transportation. Uh, what I love about the appro approach that Zoox is, taken, is taking is that by having this vehicle, and experience is extremely important. We don't call it a car because it isn't a car. It doesn't have a steering wheel. It, mm -hmm. it feels like you're walking into a living room. It's, it's very uh, practical in terms of pooling. You have two doors that just slide out on either side of the vehicle, and you can step in as opposed to climbing on top of each other. Uh, it's electric, and it, it's designed to run all day long so that when you're not using it, somebody else is using it, as opposed to being idle and depreciating 96% of the time. So I think by, by launching now, in a contained way, this is not going to be one of those that all of a sudden you see 20,000 scooters in Paris, yeah? Well, you might. <laughs> no, I think it'll take a, it'll be a little bit more gradual. Yeah. I think by doing that and by proving also the safety case, by definition, cities will get opportunities because there will be less congestion, because need for, the need for parking will be less, because the environment things will be better. And then you work hand in hand with the cities, state authorities, and also federal authorities. Everybody wants the same thing. Mm -hmm. The current, the status quo is not acceptable. Yeah, uh, I, I might offer one other yeah, uh, thought, which is whether at Uber or Lime, I've been surprised at the degree to which real estate entities want this to happen. Yep. They will get greater value from the real estate they already own because they will not have to allow X number of parking spaces yep. for people who are either residing or leasing space. The car companies want this too because the degree of accidents in urban cores doesn't help anyone, mm -hmm. not least significant. If you have ride sharing on an EV, AV platform, that might be a noteworthy exception, particularly for people who are differently abled to get around core areas. And adding to that is the 30% of the time of an added congestion because people are circling for parking. Looking for parking, right. And so... To your question thing. earlier of who's doing this, you know, I think there's a lot of cities that are in the think phase and in mm -hmm. the design phase, but some are actually starting to implement some early, early proof of concepts. Last week I was at a conference in San Jose and and the mayor of San Jose spoke about some of their, their developments. And in these new developments, they're not building parking garages mm -hmm. because they're designing them with the intention of the city having these new mobility solutions in place. So I, this is gonna be gradual, just like any new S-curve. S-curves happen gradually. Um, but you know, we're pretty convinced that you know, if you think about the, the transportation ecosystem and urban environments of the future, it's going to look very different in the future. It's going to have right services for package delivery. It's going to have intelligent, um, intelligence in the environment. And you're going to see vehicles that um, are not sitting idle 96% of the time. Are we kidding ourselves, though, to think that this is going to happen in the next few years? I mean, mayor of San Jose has been very progressive in a lot of ways on the tech side. But there are a lot of cities that aren't, including San Francisco. So right. well. 
Look, I mean, it's, in our case, uh, Zoox, we intend uh, to demonstrate uh, the capabilities of our vehicle on public road by the end of 2020. And we intend to be operating uh, in uh, a city in the United States. Which city? Um, a city in the uh -huh. United States. <laughs> <laughs> We're testing in San Francisco and Las Vegas, so maybe those are candidates. Okay. Uh, and started. It'll be the party bus on the strip. <laughs> no. Oh no 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 party bus. Okay. It's just moving people along, and uh, and making sure that it's safer and there's less. Congestion. But now you can drink. That's the whole appeal. Uh, that's not what no. we're going for. Not your. No. <laughs> All right. But, but you asked a really important question, which is the speed of adoption, uh -huh. and I think it's really important for us to to um, be very clear that this uh, the adoption rate of fully autonomous ride services for either packages or people is going gradual. to be gradual, mm -hmm. and um, and it's going to happen region by region. Mm -hmm. um, so the leading AV players have all selected the regions they want to go to first. Mm -hmm. And it's very explicit, you know, in the case of Ford, we have said very explicitly, we're going to do an initial AV ride service in Miami and then in Washington, DC. And we're going to name a third city later, mm -hmm. later, uh, later on. Uh, and so that's just three cities. So mm -hmm. there are hundreds of cities in this country, and there are other countries that have the same need for new mobility solutions. Yeah. So the adoption is going to be gradual, which is why I really don't think it's helpful for us to over-index the conversation on level four autonomy in urban environments. Uh -huh. You have to talk about the broader revolution around transportation, which includes micro-mobility. It includes making our consumer-bought vehicles safer and better experiences with advanced driver assist technologies like you know, highway assist and level three uh, uh, autonomy. And it includes things like you know, scooters and integrating scooters in with with other mobility solutions. So mm -hmm. all of it comes together as a, as a systems play. That's, I think, our responsibility as innovators in this space. I'd also focus on the geographic aspect. So particularly for this audience, and perhaps even given your own background, I don't look at US only. Mm -hmm. So we have three Chinese-born founders. We are a US-based company, but we are about EMEA. The European market is by far our most robust market. Uh, we are doing well over half our revenue in EMEA. It will continue to grow for all the reasons I noted. Much smaller areas of coverage allow people to get very far. These are cities built at a time of pedestrian traffic, even horse and carriage traffic, so they are built for this. You have a tremendous number of cities of 100,000 people or so. Those are ripe for this urbanization trend. In addition, people are open to greener ways of getting around in a way that's still atypical in the US, not least significant. You already have the bike lane and other infrastructure. So having been in Berlin and Copenhagen over the last 10 days, it is a joy getting around on any micro-mobility device, whether it's a bike, e-bike, scooter, I highly recommend it. In fact, I'd say even here, Aspen is great. For those of you who attended in the past, Aspen Meadows is not that far away by scooter. It's quite a bit away if you're walking. Uh, that's funny. <laughs> Give it a try. Question so if I, uh, one last yeah, thing. Go ahead. If I may add, we are focused in the US and we uh -huh. are focused in dense urban environment. Now, and you don't have to wear a helmet in a Zoox. No. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously we want to scale like everybody uh -huh. else, but we have a very important tenant. Drive where it's hard. Uh -huh. mm. Drive where it's unpredictable. Uh -huh. Drive where the, the traffic conditions are difficult. Drive where rush, because we, it's not just going to be robo taxis by themselves. We're going to have to yeah. be in the middle of human drivers too. And we yeah. feel that by doing that, it just teaches our AI driver to basically be safer and be I, more prepared. I drive every year from Denver to Aspen, and I'm not going to switch to a scooter for that one. So, or, or <laughs> I, I don't an, advocate uh, it. So, um, quick question from the audience. Oh, we've got one over there. Uh, Mark Mahaney with RBC. Uh, David, there are about half dozen scooter bike companies out there. What do you think is going to determine which one is wins in five years, and do you think it's a winner-take-most market? Uh, it's a great series of two questions. I'll go to the second question first. Uh, we relish competition in markets. It is not, in my opinion, a winner-take-all market, partly because many geos are artificially supply-constrained. So we do very little marketing because the scooters speak for themselves, and certain jurisdictions have artificially limited the scooters so that there's insufficient supply, San Francisco being the notable example. 
We're optimistic, particularly given certain changes that San Francisco will change its path. Uh, but until that happens, there's not enough supply to go around. Uh, even in Europe, Paris is probably over 20,000 scooters. That's from, I believe, over a dozen different players. One of the difficulties for the subscale players, which are virtually all other than, I would argue, Bird, Uber slash Jump, and most significantly, Lime, is that it's hard, even with positive unit economics that are working, to make it work for a company that has to invest in R&D. To the points made by Ken and Aisha, these are devices that have to meet certain rigorous standards, and that, frankly, costs engineering and product dollars and time. So we are investing in hardware, 75 people based in China. We are investing in safety. Every city that we launch has a first ride campaign, literally giving out the helmets, but more importantly, telling people the basic facts. People get injured on their first ride, take it easy, as I've mentioned, so I won't go into that again. Finally, and not least significantly, investing in building the bonds with government entities, the legislators, and even more so the administrators who go beyond particular administrations to make it happen. I think those are fairly significant differentiators for Lime. And I also believe, and this is where uh, VCs, notwithstanding the fact that Hans Tung of GGV is one of our VCs, Jeff Jordan is one of our VCs, VCs hate hearing that tactical execution is the differentiator, <laughs> but as someone who's had strategy in my title several times, strategy is important, but frankly, it's overrated. Tactical execution is underrated and will make the difference here. I saw that with Uber, I saw that with other entities, such as Netflix, where there are many others in their field. I believe that's true of Lime. One of the things that we've invested in is greater operational excellence. I admire the people, such as Guy Tellis of Uber, who took Brazil from 12 driver partners to over half a million. Wayne Ting, who did something similar in San Francisco. Wayne Ting is now at Lime, leading ops for us. That will be the difference maker. So to summarize, wear your helmet. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> we do unfortunately need to wrap up. Thank you guys so much for Thank being you. here with us.